from war across the globe to regulating speech to printing trillions of dollars, the American regime accepts no limits on its power. As Ludwig von Mises understood, the state will take as much power as the people will let it. And in recent years, the American regime has clearly concluded that it can get away with unilaterally adopting vast new powers. Join me, Michael Rechtenwald, along with Ted Galen Carpenter, Karen Kwiatkowski, and Jonathan Newman for a Mises Institute event in Nashville, Tennessee, dedicated to this siege of power and one of Ron Paul's favorite lines, truth is treason in the empire of lies. This event is not for those content with the comfortable narrative peddled by the corporate press, but for those interested in understanding the true face of the American regime. Come and meet up with like-minded individuals from around the country to freely engage in conversations that could get you kicked off of most social media platforms. Tickets begin at $95. Get yours at Mises.org slash Nashville 23. Use promo code RECT23. That's R-E-K-T 23 for $45 off your $95 ticket or a $50 ticket cost. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Recht, the Michael Rechtenwald podcast, a production of the Mises Institute. My guest today is Paul Gottfried. Paul is the editor of Chronicles, a magazine of American culture. He is also a professor of humanities emeritus at Elizabethtown College, where he taught for 25 years. He is a Guggenheim uh, recipient and a Yale PhD. He is an historian of the American right and the author of 14 books, most recently Anti-Fascism, The Course of a Crusade, and Revisions and Dis Dissents. Hello, Paul, and welcome to RECT. Well, thank you for having me on your program. My pleasure. It's great to have you here. Mm -hmm. um, I consider you a, a, a fountainhead of knowledge, and I, I plan to uh, pick your brain as much as possible today mm -hmm. because you have so much knowledge that people need to put in context what's happening today uh, in terms of uh, the left, I think, and in terms of the right. Uh, so... Uh, let me just start off with asking you a question I've been wondering. Uh, given your elite pedigree, you know, a, a PhD from Yale, et cetera, how did you become a conservative, let alone a paleoconservative? I mean, how did you not end up as a standard issue liberal elitist? Um, I, I was never uh, on the left since I was about, uh, I think, about 15 years old when I was briefly a Marxist Leninist. Uh, and then I think a, a, a visit to the Nero Coliseum uh, and uh, an exhibit of Soviet uh, technology and Soviet appliances um, soured me on the communist experiment. Um, I, 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 even then, by the way, I was a Republican. I was never a Democrat. I was a Republican even when I was, you know, a, uh, uh, a self-described Marxist for about six months. Uh, and I've been on the right uh, ever since. Um, uh, I, I think I think one of the defining experiences was when I was a freshman in college. Um, we had to read two works, and I, I think we may have different views of these works. Uh, sort of uh, given the fact, perhaps I'm intellectually less interested or or, or less committed to the notion of, uh, of, indiv of of human rights or individual rights or natural rights. But we had to read Locke. And then Burke's reflections on the revolution in France, and I thought I thought that Locke was describing something to which I could not even relate. People coming out of a state of nature, forming civil society, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, cre creating their own social construct. Whereas Burke's view of of the continuity of generations of prejudice, as he understood it, as the basis of uh, of an ethical all made sense to me. And, uh, you know, from that time on, I sort of thought of myself as some kind of Burkean conservative. Um, I, I also studied classics and taught classical Greek. 
and I'm ver very impressed by Aristotle's politics and Nicomachean ethics. Um, and later I wrote in Hegel, um, I've always been a fan of German philosophy, um, and particularly his um, philosophy of right uh, and the organic nature of right had a, a great influence on me. Um, and uh, I've, I've never sort of leaned left, although as, as people know, Herbert Marcuse was, was my professor. Um, <clears throat> and I was very impressed by his knowledge of German philosophy uh, and liked him personally. I, I found his, uh, his politics absolutely abhorrent, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, admired him as a scholar nonetheless. Um, the, the thing I could imagine myself being least of all, I suppose, is sort of a, a left of center Democrat uh, certainly now, but even you know, even back in the 1960s and 1970s, um, although I didn't much like him, I voted for Goldwater in 1964 uh, because I I despised Johnson and his Great Society. Um, so I I mean I you know my my paleo conservative or uh, uh, quintessentially conservative views are not something that I came by yesterday. I have held these views since I was probably a teenager. Wow, that's great. Um, yeah, Burke is just, uh, when I read Reflections on the Revolution in France, I mean, that was absolutely, well, first of all, it's one of the most beautiful pieces of writing mm -hmm. in the English mm -hmm. language, uh, as, as far as essays go. And uh, yeah, his organicism is very striking. Mm -hmm. And uh, we read that in, uh, in a course on uh, the rationality and its discontents mm -hmm. uh regarding um the uh you know the enlightenment and uh i found it to be very convincing and everybody else hated the uh hated the essay because i was in a classroom full of leftists so uh, why don't you tell us for the for those who don't know somehow uh what paleoconservatism is well, I, I think there are two different strains of paleoconservatism, something which is often not appreciated. Um, I, I, I think there are the small government, strict constitutionalist paleoconservatives, some of whom you know, probably are associated with the Mises Institute and write for us. Um, there, there are also the populist paleoconservatives who have emerged particularly since the 1990s. But I, I think what all of them have in common is the belief that the United States took a wrong turn probably, you know, sometime in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, possibly much earlier. Um, and that uh, what we see as the administrative state today is, uh, is a monstrosity uh, that we have to find some way of ending. Um, and I, I think there's also a kind of uncompromising position that we take. Uh, we, do, we do not believe that a wrong turn was taken five minutes ago, we believe it was taken a long time ago. Now, of course, some of these paleoconservatives, you know, have these sort of whimsical reactionary uh, tendencies and will tell you that, you know, it started with the fall of the Byzantine Empire or something like that. But, um, but, but certainly, I think looking at the United States in the, uh, in the 19th and 20th century, I think certain uh, fateful wrong turns were taken, the effects of which we are, we are living with. And uh, uh, we, cert we certainly uh, reject the paleoconservative positions that the United States is essentially sound. We have like the greatest government that ever existed and it's functioning and it's getting better, you know, every day in every way, um, except for some minor problems, some kinks that have to be removed, like having the Democrats rather than Mitt Romney as our president um, or Nikki Haley as our president. Um, I, I, th I think I think we understand that the problems that, that we face, social problems, political culture, are much more deeply rooted than uh, so-called mainstream conservatives, National Review, neoconservatives are willing to recognize. And the question then becomes, how can we address them, sort of given our limited power and limited resources? Uh, and and that, that is a question we're going to have to deal with. Um, I, I have to say that sort of looking at this, I have sort of moved, which I know is, you know, probably Michael's position toward um, uh, decentralized government. I can see absolutely no other way out of our situation uh, because th there's no way that right and left can live together in the United States anymore. I mean, there, right. are, there are assumptions about human nature, government, 
uh, freedom because are so diametrically opposed um, that the differences that separated the North and the South in the Civil War, you know, however disastrous the result was, uh, seem almost small by comparison to what se separates right and left. I mean, the, the left thinks it's perfectly okay for government to uh, uh, to change the gender of, of school children without even telling their parents. This is fine, you know. Why would you object unless you're a Nazi? Um, they, uh, you know, they find nothing wrong with riots uh, in the street as long as they're carried out by Black Lives Matter and the the rioters, you know, are associated with the Democratic Party. Uh, I, th I think th I think these differences are fundamental, and I see absolutely no way that they can be bridged. Yeah, I think decentralization is the only answer, and uh, how how that comes about is another question. Whether these totalitarians let us out now, I don't think we're asking for permission, but really they are totalitarian, and they yeah. uh, totalitarians tend to not let you out of their systems uh no, i I, th I think you're absolutely right they you know um authoritarians would let you out of their system you know the uh, sort of the traditional uh strongman dictatorship you know that you found in latin american countries or maybe you know for for a while in uh spain or somewhere else. um they don't care if you leave totalitarians will not let you out of the system uh, because they want total control. And I think Hannah Arendt's model does work. I mean, these are people who will use terror or any means to control you. And I think that's basically what the left in the United States has become. Yes, uh, absolutely. I've been saying this since 2016, when I sensed it rather viscerally. And uh, this is really what made my turn uh not only possible but really almost inevitable mm -hmm. um now uh you recently edited a volume which i'm reading and i'm finding excellent uh paleo conservative anthology it's a fascinating book the first essay after your introduction is by one david azarad in mm -hmm. that essay azarad discusses what paleo conservatives might teach the establishment conservatives or conservative inc uh, if you might recap that, but uh, I think more importantly, tell us what paleoconservatism might teach libertarians, especially those of the Rothbardian variety. Yeah, um, I, I, I think for one thing, the paleoconservatives, unlike the sort of radical individualist libertarians, have a sense of community. Mm -hmm. I mean, they understand the communal organic basis for social relationships, even uh, uh, e e even a free market society, I mean, you cannot operate un unless there is uh, certain tacit assumptions among the members of society and unless they share a common ethic. Otherwise, it's just it's just not going to work. Uh, I, by the way, I, I, you mentioned Rothbard. I think Rothbard, by the end of his life, fully understood that. I think mm -hmm. he definitely moved in a paleoconservative direction, um, which was quite different from the direction which was moving back in the 1950s or 1960s when he formed alliances with the new left. So uh, yeah. uh, I, th I, th I think he understood the social and cultural and historical preconditions for a free society. Uh, and that is certainly something paleoconservatives can teach, li can teach libertarians. Uh, one thing libertarians can teach paleoconservatives is how to be less isolated. Uh, I think libertarians have much more of a presence um, on the right than paleoconservatives. Uh, paleoconservatives do not have anything comparable to the Mises Institute, for instance. Right. Uh, and I think I think we have, as I point out in my essay, we have been divided in the past, and this has we are still dealing with the effects of that. And uh, I I, I, th I think there's almost a kind of radical individualism about paleoconservatives. You know, each one has his own paleoconservatism, and they and they historically have fought with each other a great deal. So uh, we 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 can learn from libertarians, uh, despite their individual ethics, you know, how to cooperate as a group. So there's a, there's a bit of uh, excessive Protestantism about it, really. Uh, this kind of constant uh, fissures. Uh, uh, <laughs> Speaking of Azerod, uh, in recent essays, one of which you cite in a recent article of your own, he takes some shots at libertarians, suggesting that they must be effectively left behind by what he calls the new right. 
This new right must embrace the levers of the state, he argues. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I again, I, I think there is division within the paleoconservative camp. Okay. And I think some of the populists have not abandoned the hope that they can gain control of the state and use it for their, their good. This was, by the way, Sam Francis's position. Right. Uh, it was not my position because I'm much more pessimistic about the possibility of gaining control of this. I have no idea how it's going to happen. Um, but I, I, I think that some of the some of the when I see the status paleoconservatives believe that, you know, they're, they're, the, the Trump revolution, uh, in a sense, prefigured uh, a, a, a right that would, you know, be able to somehow take over the state and make it serve a conservative working class base or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I wish them good luck. I just don't think it's possible. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be even within a remote uh, pos realm of possibility, uh, mm -hmm. and especially with what we're dealing with now, uh, which I'd like to sort of jump to. Uh, uh, who is who is the ruling class today? If I don't ask you this, I, I will I will kick myself. Who who is the ruling elite, and what is their ethos? What is their ideology, and what elite did they replace? Yeah, I, I think the, the elite that was there a while ago, and was, it was actually, I think, really formative for the United States, were, uh, were wasp patricians, mm -hmm. right? America's an English, an English or Northern European Protestant society, you know, in its, in its conception. And uh, it, was, it was the upper class uh, wasp patricians, North and South, even though they fought a civil war. <laughs> but they, 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 mm -hmm. these were the groups that were pretty much in charge and once the latent pleasantness was open uh, over, these you know these these groups start cooperating again, uh, as they had before the Civil War. Uh, and these people are now, of course, there is going to be um, a, a plutocratic class that becomes important with the rise of uh, of industrialization and high finance in the United States, particularly after the Civil War. Uh, but I, I think these groups become pretty much integrated. Uh, in, into the older aristocracy. Um, uh, in, in the South, it's interesting how Sephardic Jews get integrated into this, you know, this sort of Protestant patriciate within a generation or two. Of course, many of them do end up becoming Episcopalians, but th th this, uh, this ruling class can absorb people, which I think is one of its strengths. Um, uh, it, it could also be snotty and supercilious, but it absorbed groups. Uh, um, as, as did, you know, the English aristocracy over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what happened was this class became déclassé. I think they, they lost, you know, there was a, a grand déclassement. They sort of lost their, uh, their power and their influence. And then they, then they were um, replaced by a number of groups, uh, Eastern European Jews, mm -hmm. uh, Blacks, are maybe more marginal, I think, to this uh, to the replacement groups. Uh, to some extent, uh, ethnic Catholics, you know, running political machines. Um, but the uh, the wasp aristocracy would never be restored. I mean, they came back. They came back like the Bush family. You know, they really did not have that much influence. They just sort of had to had to fit in. Um, I, I think I think now. What you have uh, is 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 uh, are elites that sort of coalesce. They come together, and they cooperate. What one is a political elite, right? They run the administrative state. They run the mm -hmm. surveillance state. Uh, they have lawyers who work for them, right? Uh, judges that they appoint, um, and they are sort of able to use the administrative state and their manipulation of the constitution. Uh, to gain and and hold power, and they have a lot of it. Okay, they also cooperate with a corporate capitalist class, which now is largely woke. Mm -hmm. You know, and the woke ideology is the state religion, which they've they've all taken over. Um, and <clears throat> there there's of course the media, uh, which sort of has its own aristocracy. And in, in my book on on multiculturalism, I speak of the media as the priesthood. Um, as the priesthood of the managerial class, uh, they they are the ones who um, inculcate the state religion, which is now wokeism, um, right. and they are they're the ones who reject um, Christianity or whatever went there before, you know, and which they want to remove so they can replace it with wokeism. 
Um, uh, I think, though, there are fissures within this ruling class or the groups that form the ruling class. Um, I really wonder how much does the FBI have in common with LGBT? Right. <laughs> so how does that connect to globalists then? Um, are they globalists? Uh, uh, are they in cahoots with these globalists? Or mm -hmm. are they... Absolutely. Uh, okay. You know, I, I think they are in cahoots with the globalists. And, uh, you know, certainly the core, the woke corporate capitalists, you know, are, are part of the globalist class. There's no problem. And, you know, people like Joe Biden uh, or Louis Weber, his handlers, feel very comfortable going to Davos and to associating with the globalists. These people have absolutely no interest in preserving a nation state in the case right. of the United States. And a global order is exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, although I, I think they hope to see the American globalist elites controlling this global uh, this global society. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but you know again I think they face the problem is if you let all these uh, these nutcases loose I mean the BLM the Antifa uh, if you have all these crime in the city open borders um, how can you run the economy even a woke economy right, so right. I, I I one of the things I've argued is that at some point you're going to see something like the Night of the Long Knives in Nazi Germany to refer mm. to another total a more brutal totalitarian society. And I think there will be um, some kind of reckoning that the more rational elements within this within this totalitarian elite, um, uh, whatever holds them together, they're going to turn against uh, the, the less rational, the more riotous elements and mm -hmm. uh, the people who are the total the total social lunatics, uh, the transgender uh, groups and so forth. Yeah. Now, how did they come to use these? Uh you know, I see, I see these ground troops, these leftist ground troops, mm -hmm. uh, as the foot soldiers of these globalists, right? Uh, like Antifa and uh, BLM, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, th these are foot soldiers. So, what are they doing for them? I mean, what what is their function? Well, their function is to break up the traditional society, yeah, right, and to destroy the enemies of the globalist, right? right. I mean. Uh, uh, and of course, they're not the only ones working to do this. You also have the, uh, the you know, the uh, the FBI going after Latin mass Catholics and other people who are standing in, the, in, the, in their way. But they have they they use this disorder and confusion in order to take to to take further power for themselves. Um, however, the you know the point can be reached where it has in the case of the brown shirts, whom I think they do resemble. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, they simply become a nuisance. You know, and right. uh, they may have to be eliminated. Yeah, same thing happened in uh, after the Cultural Revolution mm -hmm. uh, in China. They they right. had to get rid of these Red Guards because mm -hmm. they had unleashed them, and then they needed to try to get the the genie back in the bottle mm -hmm. uh, because it was it, you couldn't have a stable social order of any kind with these people running rampant across the countryside. Uh, now, get, speaking of wokeness per se. Uh, you've argued in an essay that it's not Marxist. Now, uh, no, James Lindsay, um, uh, and take it for what he's worth, uh, called you an idiot for that. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, but that was on Twitter, what mm -hmm. was once Twitter. You know that I've argued that wokeness is Maoist, I think. What is it in your estimation? <clears throat> well, I, 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 th I, I think that I have to... Um... Uh, point out for the sake of fairness, there are elements of the left that go into wokeness. You know, it is definitely not a movement of the right. Um, and uh, you're, you're right. I mean, they do resemble Maoist uh, in the violence, the cultural revolution, all, all these in, in the, uh, they also, of course, resemble Nazis in what they're yeah. doing. Um, but, you know, all totalitarian movements that engage in violence seem to be doing this, seem to be going to the same stage that the totalitarian left in the United States is. Uh, an, another thing that I think makes them definitely of the left uh, is that they do have a globalist egalitarian vision of some kind, mm -hmm. um, mixed in with their hate uh, and their nihilism, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which they share with the Nazis. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I mean, there, there, are, there are some of these Nazi elements that I think are, are very, very much present, uh, very salient in, the, uh, in, in, in wokeness. 
Uh, they are not as rational as the Marxists, for one thing. I mean, the Marxists mm -hmm. have a certain view. If they think that's, you know, they're teaching um, uh, some kind of socialist um, uh, science. Uh, uh, science, right. right. And, right. Uh, yeah, Sozialismus Wissenschaft, it's socialist science they're, they're giving you. Uh, of course, it's not science, but they said they, you know, they, they, they think they're influenced by the Enlightenment, they're rationalists and so right. forth. Right. And they run orderly societies. I mean, they're brutal societies, but they're orderly. Like they have clean streets. People who make all the noise that the Antifa would be, you know, would be put in, in a concentration camp in a communist country. Mm -hmm. Um but the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the thing that is similar, if you look at the people who become wokesters in the United States or in Europe, many of them were formerly communist, mm -hmm. right? Like the East German um, uh, Al-Qaeda, the, the people who are the communist uh, uh, um, uh, rulers, uh, they, go, they all become woke. They go into East, West German politics and they take over LGBT, feminism, stuff they weren't doing in East Germany. Uh, in the United States, you find, you know, people who were pro-Marxist or uh, someone like Jerry Nadler or some of these other these other leftists. Uh, Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. starts out as a communist. Right. Uh, they all become woke in the end. That's because there is some kind of overlapping leftist temperament yeah. or even worldview, which allows them to go from traditional Marxism uh, to wokeism. So yeah, in, in terms of their mind, there is very definitely a consistency, even if I point out, you know, the the contradictions between traditional Marxism and wokeism. Yeah, they they share this oppressor oppressed dyad mm -hmm. ethos, right. uh, of um, that comes out of Marxism or that Marxism uh, appropriates from somewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, but they are more Rousseauian, I would argue. Mm -hmm. In terms of their leftism and and the way that they you know are primitive in a way they're they're primitivists mm -hmm. almost, uh, so there is that. Uh, so you know on with on with this bit about wokeness. Uh, what's the function of it? Uh, I always look for what function something like this ideology serves. What what do you think? You may have touched on this already, but what's the function of wokeness? Yeah, we're sort of like looking for a rational function of what is an utterly irrational ideology. Okay. Yeah. But I, I think you're right. I mean, it is functional for those who want to take power because it destroys all the groups who might stand in their way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, you have to destroy Christianity because uh, it, it offers an alternative worldview. Right. Right. And it was there before. You can borrow from Christianity, but, you know, take over the idea of the suffering just or some mm -hmm. apocalyptic end to history. You can, you can selectively use Christianity, but you have to destroy it. Um, it, it also appeals to groups that hate white Christian society right. uh, or ma male white Christian. That way you get all the feminists in there. Right. So so the uh, I think what really holds it together is hate. Uh, more than traditional <laughs> okay. Marxism, hate is very important. Yeah, people, you know, that, this is why I'm always bringing up Carl Schmitt. You know that the enemy determines alliances, determines who your friends are, mm -hmm. and this is certainly true of wokeness. I think more more than traditional Marxism, it it is hatred and the enemy that keep these people together. Yeah, uh, I, I remember speaking this was to a relative who was a leftist and saying that you know Trump is very dangerous because he wants to impose a Christian theocracy on the United States. <laughs> and I mean, th this might sound absurd to you, but somebody, let's say, who hates Christianity and thinks it's the enemy yeah. and identifies it with uh, white people or something, uh, the fact that Trump does not support uh, maximal demands for unconditional rights to abortion makes him a Christian theocrat, a, da a dangerous Christian theocrat. So there are people, who, lots of people out there who think this way, uh, and of course, my view is that you cannot live in the same society. <laughs> we can't live in the same yeah. society with people who think this way. <laughs> How do these people imagine that there's still some beleaguered group that they, you know, this is, I think, endemic to leftism, right? Uh, there's mm -hmm. the sense of, of being beleaguered, no matter whether you're actually right. living under a leftist totalitarian system or not. They still manage to figure themselves as beleaguered and underdogs. It's incredible. Yeah, th th this is common, by the way, to both the left and fascism. 
Okay. An Italian fa- and, and ni- neither uh, would have argued or has argued uh, that, you know, they're on their way, they're, they're, that they're in power. They're never in power. They're always <laughs> the leader. Like, yeah. you know, Mussolini, like in the middle, you know, of, of his rule would say that, you know, what we proletariat nations are being oppressed or something. This is what you hear from the left all the time. They're beleaguered. They never have power in Germany. Uh, the AfD, which is like the Republican Party here, uh, has become a neo-Nazi party, you know, for the government and for the media because they need a left, a, a right wing enemy, mm-hmm. even even if it's an imaginary one again, to struggle against and to show that they're always being beleaguered and they're always being pushed in the corner by, you know, an ever present Nazi danger. So th- this, I, th- I think you're right. This is very much uh, endemic to the left as well as to the fascists, you know, that they're always struggling against an enemy who always has the upper hand, even even when the left is in power. Yeah, even when you have them in jail I mean, right. <laughs> or close to jail, as in the case mm-hmm. of Trump, uh, who I think they used as a foil, mm-hmm. uh, in effect, to um, unite the entire left, whatever it is behind uh, the establishment, right? Isn't right. this what func- uh, function that Trump served mm-hmm. uh, to make uh, the left who otherwise would oppose, say, the military industrial complex or the uh, alphabet agencies and, uh, <laughs> the, you know, all these, uh, and the whole corporate establishment. Now they have, uh, and big tech being a major part of that, of course, they've got these leftists completely aligned on their side uh, thanks to uh, Trump as a uh, Trump, the foil Trump. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that that's, that's that's absolutely true. Uh, and uh, you know, the uh, you see people with all this power and so forth claiming to be revolutionary. You know, th- th- this reminds me of once visiting Hungary when it was a communist country. Yeah, and visiting the Academy of of Historical Science, and uh, I was introduced to the man who was who was the head of this. And I think we ended up speaking in German and my Hungarian is, was ragged by then, but I, I know German well. And uh, we were uh, talking, he was talking about how the revolution is struggling. And then he left and got into a, 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 a fancy car and was driven by a chauffeur. <laughs> and <laughs> he was out of, you know, talking about how, how, how we, the working class, have to struggle against these plutocrats. Yeah, <laughs> it's incredible. Um... It's, you know, we, we talked about this already, I think, but, you know, I think this phrase, uh, this label, I should say, is very interesting, middle, um, middle American radicals. And uh, throughout the anthology, I, uh, you know, a paleoconservative anthology, mm-hmm. which you edited, I see this phrase come up and I find it to be a really good, uh, f- a really good moniker for describing what I would call and which is un- misunderstood entirely, I think, by the left of, and the establishment itself are purposefully mischaracterized. But it's not really conservative necessarily, especially under the current context, this middle American radicals. Uh, for example, Pedro Gonzalez says they must replace the ruling elite. Uh, this is the group that must do it. Um, what do you make of this group, the middle American radicals? Isn't this the, what they call the MAG, MAGA uh, right? Isn't this the same contingent? Yeah, I think the, I think the, uh, the the two certainly overlap. Uh, although you know, one was developed by Sam Francis back in the nineteen eighties. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, I I think one has to make a distinction. At the end of the day between conservatism and the right, which I'm always doing in my work, and I'm, yeah. I'm an act as a neo-fascist or something for doing this, but I, I, I think conservatism belongs to an earlier age, mm-hmm. you know, and it comes out of the French Revolution. You see this in the 19th century. It's part of what continues to be the ancien regime. It's the people who defend a traditional hierarchical society in Europe and established church and so forth. Mm-hmm. And America, you do have conservatives, whether they're Southern landowners or Northern uh, sort of uh, Yankee patricians and so forth. There, there are, there are various aristocracies. Um, and, you know, even at people like Henry Adams, like, you know, uh, referring to the old class and being very unhappy with uh, the plutocrats who have moved into new England but I think the right is something else. The right is post-conservative. This is what mm-hmm. I've argued. 
And the right is there because they're struggling against leftist totalitarianism at the end of the day. And the left is inherently totalitarian. I don't know what anyone says. I do not believe in democratic socialism. The left is by its nature totalitarian. Right. It wants to reconstruct the human race. That's what it's about. And it's made war on the past. And the right is a reaction against this. And in America, what, what you know, Sam Francis described as middle American radicals are the people who are, you know, standing in the breach. They're the ones who are opposing this um, this takeover by the totalitarian left. Right. And, you know, as I pointed out years ago, they, they may not be to your taste. Uh, they, they do not have my musical taste. They didn't study classical Greek or, uh, you know, read Hegel in German or anything like that. Um, but they're decent people. Mm-hmm. You know, and they understand what's wrong. And yeah. that's that's the most that we can ask for, you know, yeah. at this point in time. How do we uh, connect them? Or is there a connection between this middle American right and what we might call paleo libertarianism? Uh, or w- w- really, this, let's talk about paleo libertarianism, mm-hmm. if you will. So what would that be? And, you know, I consider myself that effectively (laughs) (laughs) and uh and uh so what's the connection between these uh middle american radicals or paleo conservatives some some brand some segment as you said there's a populist uh thread uh or prong of paleo conservatism and um i think that populist thread really you know connects to this middle american radical uh, contingent how do how do these groups connect uh like the paleo libertarianism yeah uh, I think, Roth I think party it, and the Roth party and populist right you know as right, they call it right yeah. no i I think we all share the same view of what's wrong right? yeah yeah <clears throat> I mean <laughs> going back to Carl Schmidt, we all have the same fine built or concept of the enemy uh <laughs> we know exactly what we oppose, and we all oppose it the, the yeah. same thing. The question is, you know, what what are the alternatives that we have? And I'd say at the end of the day, paleo conservatives, paleo libertarians, middle American radicals um, all have to accept the same solution, which is radical decentralization. Yeah. I do not see it. You can then d- debate whether you want more or less government, more or less welfare, more or right. less free market economics. Right. But you have to find some way to deal with the totalitarian left. Yeah, that that is the first thing, right? And yeah. that, then we can all um, uh, choose, uh, you know, our alternate paths to freedom, dignity, and and whatever. Yes. So I I I, I, th- I think I think we all agree on the problem, and we all agree at least in the near term or the middle term what has to be done in order to uh, to address the problem. So some some might be you know paleo libertarian uh, anarchists and some might be mm-hmm. uh minarchists and others might be the- theocrats mm-hmm. but the question is decentralization and i think this is where libertarianism can come in as a theo- you know for with mm-hmm. the theoretical understanding of the necessity for letting people do what they will and allowing different types of decentralization different types of modes of decentralizing uh does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, the uh, I think decentralization has to come first. Yeah. Uh, and, th- and then then we can worry about, you know, what kind of economic system we have, whether we have more or less free enterprise. <clears throat> Indeed. Now, you've written recently uh, in an article in Chronicles magazine about how the Democratic Party became the party of grievance groups. In in that article, you argue that the Democratic Party is not making its constituents woke, but rather that it is the woke activists who have made the Democratic Party woke. Now, why is this an important distinction? And could it be used to explain, at least in part, the party's treatment of RFK Jr., who is in some ways at least an old school Democrat Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. supporting the working class? Yeah, that, that's true. It's exactly why they're treating him that way. Uh, he, has the, he has the same views as the Kennedys in the 1960s yeah. about these issues. <laughs> yeah, there, therefore, you know, he's put himself to the right of, uh, of both parties. 
<clears throat> seems to be pushing antediluvian positions. Uh, he's uh, he wants to limit abortion. He's very unhappy with abortion, but then he's scared, you know, that he's going to turn off uh, Democrat and Republican voters hmm. uh, by by taking that that position. Um, yeah, I think I think there is a difference between saying that you know the Democratic Party is corrupting people and saying that the Democratic Party is a home for people who are morally corrupted to start with. <laughs> uh, because that, that, then the question becomes, you know, how, did, how do the Republicans appeal to them? And you see this on Fox News, right? We have more black homosexuals than you do. Uh, here we have a transgendered Republican. Yeah. What you do is you compete for the same people by doing the same thing. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so, that's not that as well. Because you know, if, if only you can get them to change party. I mean, that the, the party affiliation is, is is I suppose from their perspective the problem. Uh, and for me, it's you know, what the hell do you do when half the population is crazy? <laughs> you know, yeah, and that's much more of a problem than you know trying to get people to move from one political party to the other. Yeah, so it's important to explain that. Well, this goes to the point that politics, at least at this level is downstream from culture uh that you're looking at uh how how this culture has shaped these people mm -hmm. and then they have in turn shaped these parties in particular in this case the democratic party primarily but uh, after all even the republican party who are competing for the same totemic mm -hmm. uh groups or mem uh you know totem uh constituents and uh the token i should say token uh token members of these various so-called beleaguered classes. Uh, and so it really shows that something has to give with the culture. But as you said, we're not going to be able to live with these people. Uh, no, no. I, what, what, to me, what, what, one of the um, remarkable examples um, of how uh, the sort of leftist woke culture takes people over is what happened to American blacks. I grew up in the 1950s in a northern industrial town uh probably not all the different from pittsburgh where you grew up and right. uh uh most blacks uh, most blacks had been republicans until the second uh roosevelt election in 1936 where they switched from uh uh they switched from republican to democratic uh but their you know their their living habits were quite conservative they had two parent families most of them were baptists it was very low crime growing up in, among blacks in the 1950s. Um, they they were not a grievance group, as far as I, I remember. Now they hate white people. Right. Um, they're you know wreck, blacks wreck, black criminals are wrecking their own neighborhoods, wrecking cities, uh, and they're obviously being encouraged by Democratic politicians. Uh, Republican response seems to be something like, you know, these people are going to vote for us if we can tear down more Confederate monuments or ban Confederate flags, you know, or talk about how bad the Democrats were because they were segregationists, you know, in 1940 or 1950, or uh, this is all nonsense. <laughs> You're not going to yeah. get those votes by, by doing that. The question is, why have these people been turned around like that? Mm -hmm. You know, why have they gone from being perfectly decent Christian people to being crazy radicals yeah right and i mean you have to and and this i think is in in many ways indicative of what has happened to american moral social culture and, and during my lifetime uh and you're going to have to deal with this problem if you can't but, but before even dealing with this problem you may have to find some way of separating yeah because you do not want to live in a society you know in which uh appeasing these groups of radicals becomes you know what one, one of the main uh, one of the main objectives of the, of the, of the political class, the social order. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I lay this because this has to go back to some subversive elites who, who have effectively, uh, militarized, uh, m made, made into militants and made into, uh, uh, radicals, uh, by this elite. I mean, they have subverted mm -hmm. these people's values in effect. I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I think it's elites that are responsible and that obviously feed black hate against whites. I mean, they, they do this all the time, yeah. of course, believing they're insulated from it because, you know, they, they, these uh, the black radicals will strike out against some poor uh, Korean shopkeeper somewhere. It's right. not going to touch them. Right, exactly. And that's that takes us to the topic of immigration. 
Uh, I think, you know, I, I want to know why do you, I mean, I think it's pretty clear given everything we've talked about already. Why is this ruling elite hell bent on unfettered immigration? Well, I mean, for, for a number of reasons. First, we get cheap labor if they, if they come in. Right. You don't have to pay as much for workers. Uh, another thing is you can uh, create your own electorate. Right. If you get enough of these people in, you're going to win every election. <laughs> I think this right. is. I think this is what this is what they are they are thinking about. Uh, another point I would make is that one of the things that helps to increase your power is to create confusion, social confusion. Hmm. Right. What well, you see in New York City. Uh, you know, the, the Biden's handlers are not unhappy. Mayor, may, may, mayor, maybe Mayor Adams doesn't like what he's seeing right now uh, or some other big city. But, uh, you know, the, the ruling class doesn't care. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, these uh, the, the more confusion you have, the better, because the easier it is to control the population. Yes, this goes to Sam Francis's. Uh, anarcho tyranny. Anarcho tyranny. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, is there anything else you would like to add? Uh, we're coming to pretty much the end of our podcast. How do people find your work? Um, where might they, uh, where might they, how, how do they get uh, connected to Chronicles magazine? How might they get a copy, et cetera, et cetera? Well, it's easy to get, get, get a subscription to Chronicles. You just go online, yeah. you know, and we are, we have a campaign now to increase subscription because, uh, uh, we're trying to move up, move up our numbers, and I think we've been sort of successful in the last few months. But I hope we'll be more successful uh, in the future. Um, I, I should point out my own books are probably not read as often as they should be. Yeah, because the conservative movement kicked me out sometime in the 1980s for resisting the neoconservative takeover. <laughs> they right. never let me back in, as right. most people know. Um, but you know, so some of my books are prescient, like the book on multiculturalism, the one I, I wrote on mass democracy in the managerial state. Uh, they're they're twenty or twenty five years old, but I think they they can still be read. One might say almost sort of as as fresh interpretations of these problems. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I do I do recommend my books for those who have not read them. Yeah, I agree with that, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I've been I've been uh, plumbing uh, plumbing your books a bit myself. I find that uh, they have uh, they, they they unlock some of the secrets of what we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. In particular, this idea of the, the managerial class and how how they're connected to this contemporary regime. Uh, I find that to be an important point. Um, yeah, I, I think that one of the arguments that makes the managerial class is there with the creation of the modern welfare state. Right. Uh, but uh, the the ideology that it embraces um will change right i mean yeah so uh, what wokeness is a relatively new ideology that has been taken over by the men and it, and it is without doubt the most destructive socially destructive absolutely absolutely well thank you so much for coming on paul it's been a pleasure and i think very informative for our listener and uh hope to have you back someday thank you so much thank you very much you're listening to Rex with Michael Rechtenwald. Find more episodes wherever you get your podcasts and get more content like this on Mises.org.